21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Dave. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray this morning to get started. Father, we thank you for this day, God, and Lord, uh, as we rested last week, dear Lord, and, and Father, as we come to this week, God, looking for our rest in you, Jesus. And in this text today, Lord, as in the, the middle of our storms in our lives, God, is exactly when you show up to offer us rest. And Father, we even remember back on this anniversary, 9-11, dear Lord, in our lives, or we look back to a time that was very frantic for many of us. We thought things were changing, God. And Lord Jesus, for your people, you never left us in those times. And for many of us, Lord, you showed up. And you've been with us ever since, just like in this story, to Lord, you, you've gotten to the boat and you were riding across to the other side with us. So Lord, I ask right now, though, there are those in this room who do not know you as one of yours. So ho- I would ask that you would send the Holy Spirit to us to open up our eyes and our ears to hear your word, to bring men's hearts alive, that they would see you for who you are, that you are the sovereign God over the oceans, the chaoticness of life, God, and that in you and only in you can safety and security and peace be found. So, Lord Jesus, speak to us today. We need your encouragement, but more than that, we need your salvation for everyone in here, Lord. And we praise you for that, and we love you, and we pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Starting off, I want to start off with a little illustration. Three jobs that I would never do, and you couldn't pay me a million bucks to do it. You ready? Number one. Many of you have seen this job. You've seen a picture of it. I'm going to show it to you. Uh, not on the screen, but I'm representative for you here. Um, it was in probably in Subway restaurants for a while. So you've seen back in the mid-1930s, there was a bunch of men who were building the skyline of New York at the time, right? And what do you remember this picture? They're all sitting here in an I-beam that stretches out into thin air. And what are they doing? Eating lunch, right? You can't pay me a million bucks for that, Right? None of us are like, that is craziness, because it brings up those, that said, if my wife, my wa- she would just die before she ever got out there, right? How many of you are like that? Like, scared of heights, right? Okay. And, and here's the weird thing, you know, me being like halfway through life now, is those fears, even though they're irrational, they get worse the older you get, right? It's, I don't know what that is. Heather and I, when we went and saw a preseason game a couple of years ago with some friends of ours, um, I didn't know it was this bad for her, but she, we had the upper seating level seats. She actually walked out and she froze. Because the seats kind of go down. You remember that, Kayla? And the seats go down like that. And, and I went, like a good husband, I went and sat down, was talking about five minutes later. I'm like, where is she? And I look up, and she's like, <laughs> and she's like frozen, fear, laughter coming out, right? So it's, it's like that. So that, that's one of those jobs, not for a million bucks, you can't pay me to do that. Second job, you can't pay me a million bucks to do. Maybe you recognize this one, coal miner. How many of you would like to be miles down into the earth, knowing that the weight of the mountain's over your head in cramped little spaces, right? How many of you have ever been to Rock City up there near Chattanooga and gone through that little tunnel part? You know what I'm talking about. Where you got to <gasps> suck in, try to get through it, right? That can't, so, yeah, and I'm okay. That probably out of all of them, that's the one that I have pro- the least problem with. But still, some of you know that fear of claustrophobic, right? Some of you can't even ride in elevators. You get that sense. Well, well how many of you, your worst fear is getting stuck in an elevator with people? right? Yeah, yeah. Power goes out, you're like, "Uh uh-oh. And you're already looking for the hatch. Matter of fact, every time I get into an elevator, I look for the hatch. Is that real? Is it really in here? Where is it? You know, so I'm looking for it. And how can I jump? And who's going to lift me up? Yeah, so I'm I'm figuring that that stuff as I go. Here's the third job you couldn't pay me a million bucks to do. And this we've learned from 
because they've actually made a show about it on TV. It's called The Deadliest Catch. How many of you have ever seen that show? Okay. You couldn't pay me a million bucks. There is no way. These guys, if you've never seen the show, they are men, fishermen in, off Alaska who fish for king crab. All right. And they go out in these boats and they go out for about three months at a time. But fishing season is the time right before, right after summer and before winter hits. That's their window. And they stay out in the water for three months. They don't come in. And they work 18-hour shifts, right? The one guy, you get your 18, you just go sleep, you come back out and you work. For three months, that's what they do. And they're in all kinds of weather, right? I mean, from everything from like when you watch it, it's nothing for them to go, and you know, they're holding on and they're trying to pull on the big cage and that's trying to come in, they're trying to get that going. And every year people die. That's one of the, the unsafest jobs you can have. If you fall in the water, you're going to be dead in five minutes unless they get to you because of the, the temperature of the water. When big storms do start coming in because it's wintertime, you can watch the ice form on the boat and they're still out there war working on this stuff, sliding back and forth. Pitch dark. So, I mean, it's just, let alone, who, who in here gets seasick? Can you imagine being stuck on that thing for three months? Like just, I mean, and we're talking rogue waves. I was watching the last season of it, first show of the season, Rogue Wade took out of one of the boats. Five guys were on that boat, only one survived. So you can't pay me a million bucks to be on that job, right? That's one of those jobs where you're looking to die, you go take that job, right? So, but I bring that up today because that's something that we all can kind of associate with. Because in our story today is what Dave just read to you. You have the disciples who are out there. It might have been deadly as catch season, but they're experiencing a lot of the same stuff in a boat that is not prepared for what they were running into. And John wrote this story, and all the scholars kind of agree about this, that as John wrote about this story, as he, as he retells the story of what happened, even though we may not be fishermen in, in some in-water sea going through this, the story is there to relate to us in sort of a metaphor telling us, in your storms of life, just as how Jesus was there for his boys, miraculously, right, walking on water, he is there for you in your storms of life. And that's the way this passage has been taught over the centuries. The Savior is there for you, even when you can't see him, even in the worst times of life. And why does John use the image of the sea? Many times, if you look through history over the eons and the years, the sea has always been pictured as this force of chaoticness, this force of darkness, this force of you can't see what's going on underneath the water, right? I mean, that's my other fear is too, is my, if falling out in the water, you know there's sharks circling that boat with all the bait in the water, right? Like you can't see in the dark what's going to bite you and attack you. You can't see what's coming. If you've ever been on the water at night, especially in a storm or anything like that, I've, I've had a couple occasions where I've just been in a rainstorm like that on a boat at night. There's no light. It's pitch dark, and you're going through this time. So the ocean represents this. And so when they use the ocean in Scripture a lot of times, it's to show you this chaotic power of which we're all underneath, or I should say susceptible to. So the way I want to bring this up today, I think many times as we talk about this, we actually, in present day, we use a lot of kind of ocean talk when we describe our lives. Have you ever noticed that? You talk to somebody, you ever use a term that's been smooth sailing, right? Or you tell someone, man, we need to batten down the hatches, right? Or, I've been through some rough weather in my life, or it's been some rough seas that we've been experiencing, right? We use the term, there's, and I looked them up, there's lots of these quotes that we use in everyday life to describe our lives because many of us, it's internally put into us to notice that life is like a storm. Or as much like our modern poets of the 1980s, whether you're, you're akin to, uh, akin to um, riding the storm out, waiting for the thaw out. Who's that? Oh, yeah, Ario, right? Or we're going to get rocked like a hurricane. Big U, shout out. All right, that's the only time we'll do that. Um, or um, sailing, take me away. I don't even know how that got in there. But, but things we, our, our modern day poets are always kind of pointing to this, this type of uh, danger ahead of us. But what I want to show us today in our story with Jesus as we travel this, this chaotic time with him is that there's an invite from the gospel. And this is your one point for today. I'm going to give you a, a one-pointer 
sermon today. Uh, when I get to the parts in the scripture, I'm going to chapter them out in three parts. They won't make sense. They're just chapter headings. But this is the thing that if I said, if you're going to write something down, this is the thing I want you to write down today. And it's this, is that the gospel invites us farther out to live deeper in faith. The gospel will always invite us further out, even when it looks calm. As you see in a story, Jesus sent his boys not when it was calm, but it got rough, right? The gospel always invites us further out so that we can become and live deeper in faith. The invite out into deeper and scarier waters is not the invite to perish, right? It's actually an invite to come to life, to come live. That's the invite into deeper and scarier waters. Or sending, let me say it this way, sending us out into deeper or stormy waters is not to prove that you can swim, but it's actually to prove how Jesus saves. Amen? Now, let me relate this to us. We talk about metaphorically. How does this look for us? When we talk about the storms of life, what does that mean when I talk about your storms of life? We all say trials. We got trials, right? I think the storms in life is represented one way. When we talk about our storms in life, there are things that come at us in our life that, that they hit us out of nowhere, right? Somebody dies. That's a trial especially unexpectedly. You weren't, you weren't expecting. It comes out of nowhere, like gale force winds and rocks your world. That's, that's a storm of life. Or things like that, things that can lead to death, like someone gets the big C, they get cancer. That's a trial that might be ongoing for a while, and it may lead to getting better, or it may lead to an even a more severe storm. Death of a child, right? These things that just come out, job loss, what am I going to do now, Right? Divorce, wasn't expecting that. What's going to happen now? All these things that come out of left field, that many, many of these things, they happen to us, we're just never expecting them, are we? We all know they're coming, but we just don't know when. And when they come, they cause these big storms. Now, I also think in that, that's where Jesus shows up, and he knows those things are going to happen. But many of us, I would say most of us are good at doing this too. Even though we know the storms are coming and we can't predict them in our lives, they're going to come. But many of us, watch this, we contribute to the storm. You know what we do? Because many times in reaction to all this chaos, the darkness and these raging seas of our lives that are coming, we're coming into, we are over here creating our own storm because you know what we're doing? We're creating our own ways to cope with the storm. This is where abuse comes from, Okay. Any type of substance abuse. And when I say like any type, I mean not just narcotics or alcohol, but food, sex, things that God given us for good things, right? And we start to abuse them to help us cope with what's over here. That's why in addictions, it doesn't do us any good just to fight addiction problems sometimes because we're doing them because we can't handle life. That's why we're doing them. So when you escape one thing, you usually start using something else to help with this, right? But here's what happens sometimes. Get this one. These storms turn. I can't do that, right? It's hard to do. You ever try to do that? <laughs> they turn the same direction, right? So one's spinning off of Africa over here. One's coming in the open water. And every once in a while, they get close, and all of a sudden, boom. And then you get this really nice eye of a hurricane. You ever see that movie, The Perfect Storm with George Clooney? You really want to be scared of dark water? Don't watch that. <laughs> that movie freaks you out, right? I've been through five hurricanes. Never been through one on water. Don't ever want to do it, right? He's out there, and what happens in the story, the movie is two storms have now connected, and they made a giant superstorm. So by the time he noticed he was in it in the eye, even to go across it, he can't get out of it. And he's out there, and you see the scene in the boat. I don't know if you watched the movie, 100-foot waves, one after the other, and all he's doing is just gunning it, trying to go up one. Makes the first one back down, and here comes another one. That it only happens like two or three times, and the boat gets capsized. There's no escape. And I think that's our lives a lot of times. We create so much turmoil and trouble here, trying to cope with what's going on over here, that we create these superstorms. And this is what we find ourselves in many times. But just to kind of give you a little glimpse before we get going this morning. This is the place and the spot where Jesus loves to come and meet us. Imagine George Clooney's reaction in that movie 
if Jesus would have walked on water at that point? How do you think he would have responded to him? And see, many people get in that spot and they never see Christ. Here's the blatant reality is how, how can we ever accept Jesus as our Savior unless we ever get to the point of needing a Savior? And for many of us, we've, some of us, we, we find Jesus, and, and we all have a lot of stories in here that he has come to us right when we needed him. That's not a coincidence, by the way. I want you to know that. That's how Jesus plans it. He'll let you make that perfect storm because he knows in the middle of that storm, that's when he's going to show up so that you see him. So that brings us to our first point this morning. Now we're going we're gonna to see how our main point, the gospel inviting us, it always invites us further out to live deeper in faith. Here's our three chapter headings. Here's the first one. That, so you can see how this kind of develops in the text this morning. Is first of all, there's a part of where Jesus backs off and we move out. Sometimes he lures us in the storms or he tells us to go ahead so that he can prep us. In the story... Here's where we are. We're going to pick up in verse 15. It says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force, that's Jesus, to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat, and they started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. I wonder, were they expecting him? That's funny. But the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. In the other Gospels, I told you last week, they have the recount of this, this because this started the whole feeding of the 5,000. All the other Gospels give this story, right? Listen to Mark's account. I want to bring it up to light here. Mark 6, 45 to 46, it says this, starting in verse 45. It says immediately, like just right after he, started, he, he fed the 5,000, it says he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd that was there. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. So Mark has the same story. He's just telling you a different glimpse of it. All right? This is what's going on. So at this point in his ministry, Jesus had already sent his disciples through a test in ministry. In Mark chapter 6, in the beginning of it, he tells his boys, I want you to don't take anything extra. I just want you to go out in my name and preach the kingdom. And tell me, come back and tell me what happens. If you've ever heard that story, that's where this just happened before they, hit, they fed the 5,000. Right after they did that, when they came back, is when John the Baptist got killed. Herod had arrested him, had him brought in, and through a series of events, Herod was tricked into beheading John the Baptist. That just happened. So when we come to the wilderness, one of the reasons that they had gone out into the wilderness was to grieve and recollect themselves. I don't know if you know that in the story. They, went, they didn't go out to the wilderness expecting someone to minister to the crowd. They went out to the wilderness to kind of, like, we need to decompress here. That's why they were out there. So at this point, in no time though, Jesus found himself performing this, this miracle of feeding the 5,000. And he shows the disciples though that he is the source of their strength and their peace. Not this little time out they were taking. And immediately he sent them out again to be tested. What it said in Mark's text, go, I've got this. I'm going to take care of the crowd. You all go. Go ahead in front of me. He sends them out again. And what we know now coming in the story is for another test, isn't he? So tragedy. Tragedy like the death of John the Baptist. It was never meant for God's people to tell them it was time to come in. It's getting too rough out there. No more fishing. He didn't tell the disciples that. It seemed that for many of the church, I think we can relate because when, it, when 9-11 happened, just to bring that in today because it is the reflection of that, right? That many took that as a warning sign in the church to come back in. Let's be safe. It's getting kind of hard out there now. Maybe we need to stop reaching out. Maybe we need to stop chasing down this discipleship dream or trying to evangelize with people. Come and be safe. And that's never been that with Jesus, has it? What does Jesus do when some of their, their past teacher just got killed? What's he do? It's time to go back out. Set sail. We're going back out. There's rough water coming, but we're not stopping right now. 
How does that make you feel to know you've got a leader like that? I need somebody like that in my life because when something bad happens to me, you know what I want to do? I want to go crawl in bed and hide. Jesus doesn't let us do that, does he? If your Jesus is telling you to do that, we probably know a different God. We need to talk about that. There's also, though, the element here of when we're sent out, that we don't have to worry about those we necessarily leave behind. Jesus said in Luke 9, 60, just a, it's not up on the screen, I'm just going to read it to you. He says, let the dead bury the dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. My question is, are, are we hung up sometime on friendships that we, that we might have to lose or comfy old haunts that we've left behind? I think sometimes in our lives, when Jesus starts to challenge us to go out into the, the deeper waters of our life, that we have to leave some relationships behind. I don't know if, we're, if you've ever been in that spot. Let me just tell you something personal that you, uh, with me that you, maybe you can just pray for me. Is my brother and my sister are not Christians. They're not saved. They're my, they're my mother's children, not my father's children. And I grew up with them, but they were gone out of the house. And, and I have an estranged relationship with them, just to be honest with you. I don't talk to them hardly ever. We had nothing to talk about. But when my parents died, I always worried about what am I going to do? My thought was, what am I going to do with them? How am I going to love them right way? Because I was thinking that my job was to save them. My job is not to save my brother and sister. My job is to witness to them, to love them, to speak to them. And I will be honest, let me confess this to you. I need to work harder at staying in contact with them. But my job is not to hang out with them. Jesus has a calling on my life. And I don't know where you're at in some relationships. Maybe God wanted me to share that story with some, someone in here. Maybe you're, 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 you're not venturing out enough because you're, you've got some old comfy haunts that you like and you're afraid to leave them. There's some relationships you don't want to let go. There's some inappropriate relationships in y'all's life that you don't want to leave. And Jesus is calling you to let them go and come follow him. So y'all could be praying for me on that one, okay? But in this story, let me ask you, who, who stayed behind with the group in this story? It was Jesus, wasn't it? So whenever Jesus sends us out again, right, on another task, another mission, and someone else will go, fine, we can always rest in the gospel at this point, that if they belong to him, he's going he's to continue to minister to them. That's his job, right? My job's to pray. My job's to reach out as I should. But Jesus is the one. That's his working of salvation. So we're coming to realize that following Jesus is being sent out into the unknown, I don't know if you've ever discovered that in your life. If you ever moved suddenly, if you ever had to leave things behind, that's how Jesus works. He just kind of suddenly goes, I want you to leave. I want you to go. I want you to go discover new things. The disciples had to physically leave Jesus behind after they witnessed the murder of their ex-teacher. They had to leave his security. They had reasons to fear, and so do we sometimes. But the invite into deeper and rougher water is an invite to learn how to live in deeper faith in Jesus. That's the invite. It's not that we're getting away from him. We're drawing closer to him. Safe waters means you get to depend on yourself. For all of us in here, there are comfort zones, ports of safe harbor that we've come accustomed to. And maybe today Jesus is inviting you to trust him. And push off, put up the oar, set sail, whatever that is, whatever lingo you need me to say to you this morning. Now, you may run into something you don't like, but listen, according to our story here, that's for the sheer joy of meeting Jesus out on the open water. What is it that God's asking you to leave? Is there inappropriateness in a relationship? Is there something you're using that you're afraid to give up? What is that? Jesus wants to meet you. And maybe, just maybe, according to like in Matthew 14, which is another recount of the story, story, we'll get to the point one day. Wouldn't that be cool we had a church full of this, that we'll get to the point one day where we could be like Peter in the story. Do you remember his account of it? Jesus is walking by and he freaks out, but what does Peter do? Lord, is that you? Yes, Peter, call me out. Come on, Peter. And he steps out on what? The water. And he walks tries to walk to him, does he? It's like, it's like, oh, great, right? And he's going down. But he took a couple steps. Maybe we'll get to this one day, but we've got to practice in our obedience. When Jesus starts sending us out, look, he's going to meet us out there. Let's just go. Let's just go. Let's be a people that goes. So the gospel of the invite is always to go farther out 
so that you can grow deeper in your faith. Here's the second chapter heading today as we learn about this little learning here on, a, on going out. The second one is, Jesus, all, he's all about this, is shock and awe. Remember that saying? Shock and awe. Look at verse 19. When they had rode about three or four miles, it says that they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were what? They were scared, man. These guys, if you notice in John's recounting of the story, they became afraid when they saw Jesus, not the waves. Did you pick up on that? A lot of these guys, the boats are seasoned fishermen. They weren't too afraid of what was going on around them, but they got scared as heck when Jesus was walking on the water by them. I wonder how we would react to that. Not everyone, see, gets to see the Lord in his natural element. Now, here's what they were actually seeing Jesus for who he was. That's what's scary about this. Don't miss this. Controlling all things, displaying sovereignty, and doing what he pleases is Jesus. That's how they saw him that night. That's weird. Like, you're living with a guy. It's like you have a roommate, and one day he comes up. He's like a superhero. Like, I didn't know that. Why didn't you ever tell me that? This is Jesus. All of a sudden, goes, I'm going to show you some of my divine power. Watch this. In John 1, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and that's who John was talking about. And what was Jesus doing in the beginning? Let me, let me kind of refresh your memory. According to Genesis 1-2, watch this. Darkness was over the face of the deep, the oceans. Darkness, the unknown, the scary things, chaos. And the Spirit of God ho- hovered over the waters because he wasn't afraid. And he, li- he likes to hang out in the middle of all that stuff. That's who was walking on water tonight. I'm just hovering. This is my domain. This is my sovereignty. Know who I am. You see, by the time we see Jesus on the waves in the middle of our struggles, this is what's becoming clear. Is that when you see him, you start to believe this. There is no way I can make it through this storm without him. When you start to see him, there's a realization that begins to dawn on you. I can't make it without Jesus. Have you ever been on that spot, folks? Happens with me every week. It's the realization that the storm, hear this, it doesn't even touch them. And we start to believe that we won't make it. It's like the point of the fact that when you're working so hard and you're bailing out water because this is what you've been doing for so long, right? Right? batting down the hatches, pulling, pulling down the sails, yelling at people, trying to take control of all things. Control freaks, right? Let's control all this. Let's control all this chaos, and let's do this. And when you look up, maybe you're the only dude in the boat that looks up, and you see Jesus. And if he's out there in the middle of this stuff, guess what that means to you? Oh, we're sunk. It gets a little scary all of a sudden. You just start to realize, I'm in the middle of this, and I can't save myself. You know what we call that in our faith? Irresistible grace. When you see the Lord Jesus coming out in the water to you, you begin to be drawing near to him. And there's something irresistible about our Lord when you see him in his glory lit up in a lightning sky, when you're out there by yourself, or even with a group of people, but you happen to see him, something begins to draw you to him. It's irresistible. It's the draw of a powerful Savior. There's a result of this terrifying vision. In, in Matthew's account, listen to what happened after Peter kind of failed in his attempt to walk out to him. In Matthew 14, 33, it says this, And those in the boat did what? They worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. It's only when Jesus shows up in the midst of a storm do we learn how to worship him. See, that's the point. We don't know how to worship God. Why does he let us go in storms? you got to learn how to worship you're his people. This is a teaching moment. Hurricanes got to be teaching moments. That's crazy. And I know. But the invite of the gospel is to learn how to become proper worshipers of God. And that comes not from just being way out and from getting in trouble when you're out there. Control freaks. I want to mention this for a minute. I said that a little while ago. See, our problem is our disbelief that God, how many of you have heard this, is not great enough not great enough. That's why you keep your head in the boat. You think he's not there for you. You think you could do all this. 
That's why Jesus uses storms to show you his power control freaks. He wants you to give up and look at him. And this is so important for the church, not just to have people that say they follow Jesus, but to have people that have experienced storms and direct intervention from the Son of God. This is why we need the church, folks. We need to have people in this church that many of you, as I look around the room and I, and I make face contact with some of you guys, I know some of the storms that you're going through. This is why the church needs you, because this is how the church becomes a testimony to the world, is people who've been through storms. The primary reason we were created was to bring God glory. You ever hear that? And worship, which in this passage means to bow down, to prostrate thyself, but oneself, is the thing that brings God glory the most. Did you know that? When you worship God, that brings him glory to an unbelieving world. To share with others that we were glad, listen, I don't know if you've ever done this, but to share with others that we were glad we were in the storm, right? To be able to see God working is actually to glimpse the divine. Most people don't get that. If you've been in a storm and you've seen Jesus come to you and you need him, you're glimpsing a divine power. People never see that stuff. I wonder if you've seen it. To know that we're not alone in the universe comes not from God answering your prayers for more money or for security or peace, but comes from a sense of peace that God brings when you're in distress. That's why we're getting this. We need this church. We also worship by showing Jesus the proper respect and fear that he should receive. Now, let me explain what that is. The world needs to see a people who are not afraid of a God that will do something drastic to us if we don't listen, but they need to see a people that are afraid to live without Jesus for fear of being left up to the world. The world needs to see us, church, as we go through our lives, that the first thing you do when we hit a storm, do you know what we do? Instead of trying to work harder to get ourselves out of it, what do we do? Lord, please. That's what the world needs to see. That's worship. Every time we do that in front of somebody. We gotta ha- that's respect and fear. Understanding who Jesus is and his sovereign power. Here's what life storms are teaching you and me. That it's so hard to be obedient to God, to listen to him when it's quiet and when we think we're not in danger, isn't it? It's hard to hear him when it's quiet. Now, think about that. You hear him better when it's loud. That's why I speak loud. You hear him better when it's loud than when you do and everything's quiet. Because you don't think you're in danger. That when we've got, gone through the times in our lives and, excuse me, I lost my place. <laughs> and we think we're not in danger. But when, when we've not gone through the times in our lives when he's shown brightly in the dark on a stormy night. See, dependency on Jesus is taught in storms not in calm waters, but the dependency learned in storms is dependency not quickly abandoned. Let me, let me, let me explain this to you. And guys, I'm going to, some of you guys are football fans in here. Today. And if you're not, if you're, if you're some other kind of fan, same thing goes for you. If you're, if you're a movie buff or ladies, whatever you lose yourself in. Some of you guys just don't watch a game a weekend. You'll watch like 10 hours of football. Here's what that means, is that you're losing yourself in something that the world's giving you to relax in. And do you know what the danger is in those times? Is you'll stop praying to Jesus as much as when you're in the hard times. Because football has now become the savior for you because it's delivering you from your em- emotional distress. Am I making a point? So you're hanging on to the mass of, emotion, of emotional ease. And, and, and maybe you all can recognize this, but whatever you are holding on to, ladies, I don't know, what the, maybe it's just shopping. The more you're distressed, the more you go shopping. The more you're distressed, the more you'll eat. The more you're distressed, the more you'll, you'll go looking for something to make you feel better. Does that make sense? And do you know why Jesus puts you in storms? Because you start learning how to be dependent on him. So when you're in this time and you get kind of, oh, wait a minute, I'm still, uh, Lord, thank you for letting me enjoy this today, but thank you for being with me. And you begin to learn that in all seasons of life, how does this apply to our lives? You begin to learn in all seasons of life that I really do need to read my Bible because I like being with him because he's so awesome. I really like praying to him because I know he shows up. I really like to practice what the Bible says. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto me. And so in the times of calm, when you're just as called as much to the world to witness, you become dependent on him even in these times. That's why you're in the storms, by the way. So you learn that. Not just for the storm times, but for all times of life. Worship is all of life, isn't it? 
And that's why we're there. Dependency on him all the time. So the gospel, again, is inviting us further out so that we could become more obedient in our faith. This is why we're here. Third chapter, and our last one. It comes with peace and relief. Peace and relief. Look what happened to the guys on the boat. Verse 20 says, But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. And they were, what? Glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at land to which they were going. By the way, that's the second miracle. I don't know if you caught that. The boat just went, pew, pew. it turned into a hovercraft like that. And it went, pew, pew. they were there. Peace and relief came only when Jesus got in the boat. Specifically these words, ergo I me, I am. Where have you heard that before in the Bible? Moses' account of the bush? I am. I am the sum of all power. Fear not, he says. Don't you see that this should begin to drive us out into deeper waters? Let me ask you a question, church. Where else are you going to meet Jesus unless in the deep water? To hear and receive comfort. This is the environment in the deep waters where disciples are made, by the way. Our calling is to make disciples. This is where it happens in our deep waters together. It's only when we've all felt Jesus' rescuing power and presence that we can truly become his followers. This was important here before Jesus to put his disciples through this test, through this night. It was important because he was looking forward. Because later on in chapter 6, verse 66, we see that everyone left them later in this chapter. I don't know if you saw that, if you read ahead or not. All the people that he had fed the bread to and, and the fish, they followed him around the water. We're going to get to that later on this month. And in 6... 66, they left him because they believed not in Jesus as who he was, but they wanted the king. Which, by the way, you Bible nerds in here, do you hear me just say 666? Because they were believing in the spirit of the Antichrist. They wanted, uh, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. I just want some of you, I'm wondering if y'all pick that up. Okay, I'm just saying. I saw, I was like, whoa, what is that? All right, you conspiracy theorists in here, all right? So, but it's 12 that worshiped him because of the rescue out in the storm in deeper waters. They stayed. Now, why did they stay? They went through the storm. That's kind of simple, isn't it? They were the ones that were rescued by Jesus. They stayed with him. Peter said, where do we go, Lord? Because you have eternal life. Where else can we go? So many of us right now, see, we're recognizing the story, aren't we? Right? Some of you are going, yep, I know this story. Because we can really associate with it. Here Now, here's why. Because Jesus has done the same thing for you, hasn't he? Many of you in here have met him, and you're not going to leave him. Where can I go, Lord? See, when you meet Jesus like that, you don't want to leave him, right? He showed up for you when you needed him the most. Now, you saw, you saw, and John, which his whole big thing is about the signs, you saw the only sign that mattered. You know what sign that was? Jesus tells us what it is. In Luke eleven twenty nine 29 to 30, listen to this sign. He says, when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of who? Jonah. For Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh. So will the Son of Man be to this generation. Now, those, I, I think even a lot of people who, who are not in church, or if you're here today visiting, you're not much engaged in church culture, you all know the story of Jonah, right? It's the famous dude who got swallowed by a fish for three days and got spit back up on the ground, and he went ahead to preach, Right? So Jesus gives us all one sign, he says. We're only going to get this one. So that we would believe this to make disciples, right? Jonah in the Old Testament was actually not a great guy. When you study his life, he's kind of like didn't want to, he didn't want to do it. Jonah was the picture for us of disobedient Israel. That was who Jonah was. That's what God used his image for, which is really a picture of disobedient us, by the way. We're God's people, right? The church is now God's people. So Jonah represented disobedient Israel, which is who we are. So listen to this. When Jonah gets the word from God and he tries to flee, I don't want to do this, Lord. I'm not going to Nineveh. That's our enemy. When he tries to feel, excuse me, flee the will of God to preach, Jesus left his father willingly for us. In Philippians 2, that put down his divine power and says, I'll go, Father. He leaves willingly. When Jonah tries to flee the, 
the will of God. Jesus leaves willingly. When Jonah griped about taking God's word to sinners, Lord, why am I taking it to these people who are our enemy? Jesus delighted in it. I've come for the sick, not for the healthy. That's why I'm here. How many of us have kind of refused to take the word to those who need to hear it? You're going to find it out there in deeper waters. When Jonah tried to hide from God, Jesus shined for God because, you know, Jesus always pointed glory back to God. If you see me, you've seen the Father. This is why I exist, is to show you him. Jonah wanted to hide God's glory. Jesus showed it. When Jonah finally felt that he had been caught up with by God, I don't know if you remember the story, it was a stormy night on the water. Go figure. He had created the perfect storm, and then he added to it. Boom! And it had him. And he finally looked at the guys trying to hide from him and says, yeah, it's my fault. You have to throw me over. And maybe God will stop. You know what Jesus does for us? Because when we finally get caught up in the storms of our lives, Jesus volunteers, I'm jumping over. You stay. You get that picture? Because disobedient Jonah is disobedient us. And Jesus throws himself over. And he jumps for us in our rebellion. When we should have been swallowed up by death, Jesus jumped into a Category 5 hurricane called God's wrath that no one escapes. And it's coming for everybody. In Jonah 2, we see this beautiful psalm that Jonah writes. And he talks about how even in, in death, I've gone down to the deep of the waters and Sheol, or death, has closed over him. He's given this picture of being cut off from God. Swallowed up, Jonah And death also swallowed up Jesus. And just like Jonah, on the third day, the fish gave up Jonah because Jonah had finally learned his lesson of who he was living for. Listen, on the third day, the grave gave up Jesus because the grave finally learned who Jesus was. You can't hold me. And it spit him up. And death was conquered by our Lord's obedience to jump in the water, to do what we didn't want to do. There's one storm we can't go through, guys, with him. It's this one. And where Jonah grieved over the repentance of the people, like he went on the Nineveh, if you don't know the story, and he preached to them. It was like, yeah, you're all going to get killed, basically, was the, pre- was the words, right? <laughs> repent or die, and I know you're not going to repent. So, And then they repented. Guess what they saw? Testimony of someone going through a storm. Who didn't was but he was kind of like didn't want to do it but when people see jesus coming through the storm what happens in their hearts there's irresistible grace now and we know this that jesus rejoices and he continues to redeem a people for his own family he doesn't do it reluctantly he does it every day and we know this because he's now riding in the boat all the way to the other side of life, getting us there under his own protection. That's a picture of perseverance of the saints, by the way, guys. Jesus gets in the boat. He never gets back out, does he? And you always have the memory of him rescuing you right in front of you. He's always with us. So the lesson we learn from the invite into deeper water, with deeper faith, is that Jesus will never leave us. And once we've gotten through that storm with him, no matter the conditions, you're always going to be brought home. You're always going to be brought home. Now, there's one more thing I'd ask for my family today as we close. Here's my question. What's keeping you from taking Jesus in the boat this morning? Is there something that's nagging you, even though the Spirit of God is provoking you and poking you in the side right now lovingly, and you're reluctant to take him in the boat? Do you think you're struggling with life fine and you don't need him? Doing okay, I'm treading water. Do you think you found the way to navigate the perfect storms? This is why we have the church again. If you think that's you, I invite you to come live here for a while with us because you're going to find a room full of people who are going to tell you the same thing. No, you're not. We've been there. There's only one way out of this. Do you think you haven't been found to be worthy of this life? Now, maybe that's, maybe that's your position today. And I want to remind you something about the gospel. Because remember, the gospel is not about proving that you can do this life, right? It's all about Jesus proving to you that he's already done it. That's the gospel. You don't have to. There's nothing you have to prove to him. The gospel proves to you that Jesus has done this. So have you 
I wonder, my folks, have you seen him walking by this morning? Are you willing to cry out in faith to him so that you get to hear, I'm here, don't be afraid? See, the gospel has invited us further out this morning so that we may discover the joy of our faith, who is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We're going to pray right now. And, and I have for my friends out there, my family, maybe as we pray, I want to pray with you and help you pray this morning. I think some of you might be in a spot today where maybe you got to a comfortable spot and you forgot you're supposed to be dependent on Christ always, right? Well, we all got to be reminded of that, right? We get into the easy way of life for a couple of weeks. All of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, 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 right? We forget that. Things, you went through a storm and you're taking that breath, whew, right? Now, you remember in the story, what did Jesus do? Get out there in the boat, keep going. Okay, Lord because he's our peace, right? So we got to cling to that. We got to cling to him. Some of us are here today, and, and you may be in between the storms, or you might be right in the middle of a storm. Whatever that is, you've got some depression, disappointment, fear, anxiety going on, whatever God's showing you in your heart right now, and he's walking by. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray that over the next few days that you pray, Lord, is that you? And listen to what he'll say to you through his word. And I want to challenge you just to read God's word this week. Remember when we taught this a couple weeks ago? Don't go looking for answers. What do you go looking for? Jesus. Look for him in the Bible. Look for him. How's he speaking to you? And I want to pray for you right now and ask that God will show up big and just pass by. So big that you cannot resist him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that for in scriptures you have painted a picture of your son who is full of sovereign power. Not just power for change, as we talked about last week, Lord, but it's power that saves us from our deepest thing that we could not escape. That Jesus showing the sign of Jonah has rescued his people. Amen. So Lord, right now, I pray for my friends in this room and my family members, God, who may be just in a kind of a lull in between the storms. The life is nothing but a storm. Lord, help us to remember to be dependent on you, to turn back to you every day, seek you in, our, in, in reading of your word and prayers, in our relationships with each other, talking about you constantly. Help us to continue to seek you. Help us to remember, Lord, that we don't have to prove ourselves in this storm, that we're riding with you, Jesus. You've already proved it by showing the sign of Jonah. Help us who are control freaks in here, dear Lord, to believe that you are great enough to rescue us out of any storm there is. So I have friends in here right now, Lord, who again are in the middle of a storm. And maybe they have faith in you, Lord, but they're forgetting. And they're trying to bail out quickly, dear Lord. But the water keeps coming in. Help them to turn to you and repent and call your name again. And you're there for them. And we may have some friends in here today, Lord, who've not ever known you like that. But they're they're starting to see you now. They're starting to see you walking by. They're hearing the stories of your son, Father. And they're starting to learn that the only way they're going to get through this is to call on your son's name. And they're realizing, dear Lord, that by Jesus walking by and them seeing him with their eyes and their mind, Lord, as it's opening toward them, is you revealing who the Son is. By grace are we saved through faith. So Lord, right now, if that's you in here, that you would say that I've never needed Jesus as a Savior because I never knew I was sinking until now. In your heart, in your mind, you pray a simple prayer to yourself or whether out loud. It's just something that sounds like this. Dear Lord Jesus, save me from this drowning, sinking vessel of my life. I know that you need to be my Savior. I need to learn how does that happen and help me to do that. Forgive me where I've not called out to you, where I've thought I can do this on my own and help me to follow you. Get in the boat with me, Jesus, in my life. And never leave me. And his promise is to you, he won't. So Lord, today for those who may have prayed that, my challenge for you right now, that was your prayer. Seek me out before you leave. Let me pray with you.
Father, as we come to our time of communion right now, and we look upon the, the elements to Lord as Christ provided them for us, it's to remind us of the sign of Jonah, of what he did for us, God. So help us to celebrate that now as a family, dear Lord, and grow our faith even more today. And we pray that in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.